Good evening and a happy Sabbath. We want to welcome you to our program this evening. We want to do some Bible exploration here and study from the Word of God and see what God says in His Word today. This is our follow-up from about two weeks ago when we sat here and the panelists discussed on our topic who will be saved. That discussion we widely discussed and we found out that God is out to save everyone who is willing to be saved. And one of the panelists brought up an idea which he called justification. That we were justified by Christ on the cross. And so everybody has been saved. Everybody has been justified. We could not make it on our own, but because of Christ, everybody has a chance to be saved. We will pray, we will do a recap, and we will continue today's topic. I want to invite, uh, before we pray, I want to invite uh, my panelists here today so that we can introduce ourselves and then learn the word of God. From my far left, Senator Evans, Senator Evans, please. Happy Sabbath and uh, welcome to this discussion this afternoon. Uh, I want to tell you it's going to be a very interesting one, and very important in our lives. So, have time and sit together, have your Bible, and refer to what we want to discuss this afternoon. Thank you very much, Elder Evans. Uh, close to me here, close to my left, is uh, Brother Ribo. Brother Ribo, please. Uh, good afternoon and uh, happy Sabbath. Uh, welcome to this uh, afternoon discussion on a topic that we really need to understand as Christians. So I look forward to your participation in this program for you. And keep it up. Uh, thank you very much. I want to invite uh, Brother Ribo to open up with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Okay. Our Heavenly Father is up in the house that will come before your presence, open up your word, to understand that which is your will for us in our lives. You have planned for us. May your Holy Spirit open up with us and guide us so that we can understand and apply whatever we study today in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. I want to welcome everyone who has joined us as we discuss the word of God. Let's look back. Who will be saved? I want to begin from Elder Evans. So Elder Evans, we spoke about justification. What is this we are calling justification? Yeah, thank you, Elder. Um, if I remember very well, I can only say in a very simple statement, justification is an act of God where the sinner who has accepted the sacrifice of Christ by faith is justified or is made uh, acceptable or is reconciled to God. So it is an act of God. He is the active person in this that he has the one to remove our unrighteousness and recover us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The only thing the sinner does is by faith to accept what Christ has done for us. So the acceptance of what Christ has done is what we are calling justification. Uh, Brother Rebo. Uh, thank you, Elder. In simple terms, 
accounts of what we learned is that uh, justification is an act of God to save us through Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And then on our part, we are just required to believe and accept that sacrifice that Christ made for our sins to reconcile us with God. Thank you very much. It was an expensive endeavor to come and save us from our sins. And there's no human being, there's no creature who could have done it except Christ. And so Christ came and he paid the debt. The debt has been paid for us, and so what we owe Christ is our love, is our acceptance. And total acceptance of his merits, what he has done for us, is what we owe him to do or to accept him. And what, when we have accepted now, because he did it for us, we are not done. So now the question of the panelists, when we have been justified, are we being saved completely? Are we being saved eternally? Um, no. Justification is the beginning of a Christian life. Somebody may ask a question. What about the thief who was on the cross that moment when Jesus was crucified too? Because he accepted Christ, he told him, Lord, when you are in your kingdom, help you also in the land. And Jesus told him, I'll tell you the truth, where I will be, you will be there. So, did he go through sanctification? <laughs> the answer is no. But, justification is very important. There is no sanctification if there is no justification. So, the, the, the first thing that occurs is that we have to cross on from death to life. So once we have crossed over from death to life by accepting Jesus Christ and Him laying upon us His righteousness, taking away our sins, then we start a walk with Him. So for those of us who are living, I just want to, to, to ask you remember when you first believed and all the years you have lived, all the days you have lived, just figure out what has been happening in your life. Have you been like the day you were baptized? Because I want to believe that day when you believed, you felt you were very unworthy. You wanted the merits of Christ to make you whole, and they did. So what happened then after that? So in other words, sanctification is a process where we shall need to walk with God. So once, once justified doesn't mean you are once saved and saved for all, it's a start for us to walk with God, to have an experience with God. Thank you very much. Once you have been justified, it's just an introductory in the race we are going through. But everybody, you have anything else to add to that? Um, I think mine will, will just confirm what I already said, that uh, once you've been justified, that is phase one. Then you move to phase two, which is also a process that we, we undergo as we move closer to be what God expects us to be in His presence. Amen.
Let's come to today's discussion and we want to start from the book of John chapter 17 and I want to read verse 17. To give you a context of this chapter, Jesus is praying for his disciples and he also prays for us. Then in verse 17 he speaks some words in his prayer and he says this, I want to read it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus speaks about sanctification. Sanctify them by your truth. And your word is truth. Two things or three things I want us to pick out from that verse. Number one is sanctify. Number two, sanctified by the truth. And number three is the word is the truth. Let's begin from the very first. When we will we will have spoken about the three things I have spoken here that we will have been done. So please follow very carefully so that we don't lose anyone on the way. Number one, sanctify. Want to read that text again? Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. What is sanctification? Jesus says, sanctify them by the truth. So what is sanctification? Yes, Brother Rico, what is sanctification? I did try to find out what the, the sanctification is. Again, there are different uh, definitions of what sanctification is, or to sanctify, but they all point out one thing, that it is setting apart something or somebody apart for a special purpose. And then, I like what, what I found uh, the, the definition in the Wikipedia. Uh, it says to sanctify that verb means to set apart for special use or purpose. And then it is to make holy or sacred. This word, making holy or sacred, uh, is derived from a, a Latin name called sanctus. That's putting something aside for a special, not just for any use, but a specific purpose. And then when you come to sanctification, now that's the process of achieving that. And it says, It is a state or a process of setting apart something for special use. It's a process of being made holy as a vessel full of the Holy Spirit of God. Setting apart is making holy a vessel full of the Holy Spirit of God. Let's underline that. Full of the Holy Spirit of God. And then it also refers to the change that God brings in a believer's life. They change the whole process of change that comes in that process of sanctification. And then it begins at the point of salvation when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And it continues throughout the life of a believer. So after accepting Jesus Christ, is now that process that follows. How do you follow up your salvation? Thank you. Thank you much, Mr. Evans. I wrote very far from what the neighbor said. I may confirm by saying that sanctification is a three-stage process. 
which is past, present, and future. Past has already been done. In other words, you cannot be set apart unless God does the first act of counting us righteousness. Righteous by clothing us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ through our faith in Christ. So the first stage occurs at the beginning of Christian lives. So everybody has already started. Whoever is a Christian has already done the first uh, stage. So this present is a longer process. It continues throughout our lives. And this is where we we, 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 the, the one writer was saying that this is where there is the reorientation of desires and we develop a love of righteousness. So, those things that we were doing as sinners, they will not, they will not go away one day, we will not overcome them one day. Sometimes people fall back to where they were because they find they are not moving towards what they anticipate. Forgetting that once we were justified, we started a walk, a longer walk with sin. Because now sin becomes more magnified. So the, the thing is that it is three stages. The first stage is past. It is the present one where we are learning who God is. What does he want me to do? How do I do it? So we, we continually surrender to the will of God as he keeps recreating his image in our lives. And uh, the future one is here to come. We'll talk about later. So right now we are concerned about the present. So for me, let me say something before I, I give it. Yeah. I'm reading from the book of uh, John, and uh, the man say uh, John 17, but I want to read it first. Three. John chapter 17, verse 3, and then I go to Luke chapter 2. Let me first of all look at the same John chapter 17. As three. It says, um, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So, verse 17, which I have not read, was sent by them by the truth. And your word is truth. Now, verse 3 says, This is eternal life. So, what is eternal life? Eternal life is knowing the true God and believing the one who was sent. That is eternal life. So, who is Jesus? It's another question which I want us. To God here, as we engage ourselves in sanctification, it's not, it's not, it's not a gimmick, it's not a science, it's a very simple thing we will see today. But I want us to look at Luke, Luke chapter 2, that's what I want us to do right now, so that we, chapter 2, the whole of chapter 2 of Luke talks about Jesus. Being born. But you can read the whole of it. But my interest, especially for this, is I uh, want to pick it from verse 25. It says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. 
And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 26 says, And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord, the Lord is Christ. Now, verse 27 says, So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed the Lord and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. So who is Jesus? Who did Simeon see? What did Simeon see? Simeon saw salvation. So what is salvation? It is Jesus. By the way, when you look at Jesus from Greek, it's your show. Your means God. Sure means saves. God saves. So, according to this, see Jesus, you have seen salvation. Knowing Jesus, you have got salvation. Knowing Jesus, you have got eternal life. So, let me stop there and continue. Have you got something else to add there? Okay, I, I guess maybe let's uh, refer to a text here. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. And then it will tell us, okay, we are talking about sanctification. God did give us a provision for justification. And when we believe in Jesus Christ, we get that access to salvation. Uh, Hebrews 10.10, 10. what does it say? So, who, who sanctifies? And by that, and by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And by that, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, God sanctifies us through the Holy Spirit. There are three personalities here, we have this distinguish. It is God's will that we get saved, we get salvation. And to get that salvation, we access it by accepting the sacrifice that Christ offered for our sins. So God's will is that we get sanctified, justified, and we attain eternal life. And that we attain is by believing in who? Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he gave. Is that all? That is not all. We are coming to that as an elder uh, read from John 17, 17. Another aspect for this process to be complete, this process of salvation is by getting the power of the Holy Spirit. God's will is that we get saved. Christ provides the foundation of the basis for our salvation. And by the empowering and guidance of the Holy Spirit, then we will be enabled to go through the process of sanctification. Thank you very much. I think what we or what I have heard you say in sanctification is the setting apart for a special purpose. And so if Christ has set us apart for that special purpose,
that we have been sanctified. He has done it for us. So, another definition is cleansing us from our sins, to make us holy, to make us pure for his purpose. My next question will be, I want to remain on sanctification so that we don't have to lose anybody. Why do I need sanctification? Well, the Evans said, this is a process. It's an ongoing process. So why do I need it? Now the Evans coming. Uh, one, one thing I want us to to know and understand is that salvation is not an event. It's not an event. It's a person. And this person is Jesus. When we read the Bible, the, the apostles, and especially Paul, says the fullness of God is in Christ. So once we are Christ, we are everything of God. So if it's not an event, then why is God so much interested? The definition is set apart. I just want us to imagine one aspect. God hates evil. His wrath is kindled in the presence of evil. In the presence of sin. So, if, whenever there is sin or whenever there is evil, what is wrath <laughs> is kindled. So, if it appears before him, it will be consumed. So God, so loving, He wants us, and the only way we can come close to God, we can come to that relationship that was there before sin came, sin has to be removed from our lives. And that is why He has to set us apart by sanctifying us. And the process of sanctifying us is recreate us a new. It creates us new hearts, it creates us new spirits, it creates us everything. That is why this is important. The next phase after this is that those who will stand before God have to wear immortal bodies. There is no human being who will wear a mortal body with sin. Sin has to be removed totally for us to be strengthened. So, it is important that we have to be sanctified. Maybe before, uh, let me read this one. Why? The word no from Greek is conoscos. And then it means to be intimate. It, it brings the concept of intimacy. So this is a relationship. So the process of sanctification is the process of knowing God, becoming intimate with God, developing a relationship. Now, this is how the Spirit of Prophecy says, as Christ of page 114. The experimental knowledge of God, Jesus Christ, whom we are sent, transforms man into the image of God. It gives to man the mastery of himself, bringing all impulse 
and every kind of inclinations or passions under the control of higher powers of the mind. It makes every possessor the son or daughter of God and the heir of the heavenly kingdom. It brings him into communion with the mind of the infinite and opens to him the rich treasures of the universe. So that is why God is very keen to ensure that we are sanctified. Without sanctification, we shall not be able to overcome the impulse, the natural passions or inclinations to see. We shall not be able to bring under control those things that upset us. We are easily upset by very simple things. It's our nature. But that has to change. And that to change through God indwelling in us who is always good. That can only happen as we continually surrender. He keeps filling us with His Holy Spirit. Day one, day two, until we see Jesus come. So lastly, life eternal is to Conosmus, Jesus. In other words, life eternal or sanctification is to know Jesus and God the Father. And that means we have to develop a relationship, a constant, intimate friendship with the Father and with the Son. And that can only happen Maybe in the next phase, uh, the last question. <laughs> Thank you much, uh, Brother Rigo. Do you have anything to add? Why sanctification? Do you have any question or do you have anything to add on that? Uh, yes. Let me give, give a small example. That will help us understand why we need sanctification. We all know the hymns. There is a, a game called Athletics, cross country, or marathon, not, not in the track. Um, they start at a certain point, and they will finish at a certain point, the finishing line. All the way, the route, route markers, the officials, who will ensure that only those who started the race are the only ones who will end the race and get the reward for finishing the race. Why? Because there are some people, we are human beings. You are given that opportunity to run, showcase your strength. Some hide along the way, they don't start. They want to enter by the way, in, in between, and the rest of those who have run like uh, eight, nine miles before they reach 12 miles mark to finish. And there are those who start and they don't finish. You, someone can find his way to the finishing line and say, I started, I'm here, I finished. So you have not gone through the process of the competition, running competition. If you are in the race, you have accepted Jesus Christ, you have to hang in there. Go through all the process. You accept Jesus Christ, and now acquire the qualities and the strength that God needs you to have, so that after the, the goal of sanctification, process is to acquire Christ-likeness. To be like Christ. You can't start the race, go and sleep, and when the final whistle goes, you want to be found at the finishing, uh, at the third line, and then say you are in the race. You are not in the race. We should be in the race all through. It feels gradually. Thank you very much. I think that's a very good analogy you have given there. The Bible, in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 23, 
It says, All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And so, because everyone has sinned and they have fallen short of God's glory, then sanctification is very necessary for us. Because it will purify us, it will alienate us from the dominion of sin, it will destroy our propensities of the fallen nature, it will rectify our affections and inclinations, and it will bring our entire being in subjection to the will of God. And so for that reason, and the reasons my brothers have given here, we definitely need sanctification. I think uh, those ones who have just showed us, we began from where we stopped uh, two weeks ago. Who will be saved? And in that process, we came to the word justification. And we found that justification is the word, work of God which he has already done for us on the cross. And so when we accept him, we are justified. But is that enough to save us? And the answer was no. We have a process to go through. So justification is at the start point. So we have the process to go through and the process now here is sanctification. Do we have said this process we have divided, it's making us holy, setting us apart, making us pure, so that we are ready to be in the work of God. We have answered the question, why do we need it? And the simple answer is because we are sinners. Now the next question is to the parents. And those ones who have just joined us, and those ones who are in the sanctuary, if you, are, if, if you have a question, you can use the YouTube to send in your questions. You can, uh, you can pick a mic and ask a question or comment as we continue. Here comes the question. So who sanctifies us? Who sanctifies us? Why do we need it? We, are, we know now why we need it. So, who sanctifies us? Yes, Brother Edward. Now, um, as we mentioned earlier on, that, that um, in the process of uh, serving man, serving us, God is involved in his trinity. One, as I mentioned earlier on, is that God's will is for us to be saved. And salvation is achieved first by being justified, by being counted righteous because of the sacrifice of who? Jesus Christ, we are accepted. And now, when we are accepted in Jesus Christ, the process of sanctification sets in. And from John 17, verse 17, as we read, is that the word of God and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit help us or take us through sanctification process. And this is uh, what it says. When we receive Jesus Christ, we need to move a step further to understand the will of God and to do that will of God. And to do that, we have to hear the Holy Spirit. When Christ was about to leave for help, he says, I go to heaven, but I will send you a helper. And this helper will help you 
will comfort you, will make you understand the will of God, which we get through the Bible. We understand and he enables us to achieve it. So it is the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Uh, Elder Evans. Trying to yes, first of all, I want to answer your question. Yes, please answer my question. Don't call me all questions. I want to answer your question. I want to read into this. The law that the fourth commandment tells us um, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. The Father says, This is the one which shows that God is the creator and God is the sanctifier. So, the one who sanctifies us is God Himself. Nothing else. We can't. We can't make ourselves whole. We can't make ourselves holy. It is God who sanctifies us. So when we come to God, we know two things. One, He will forgive me my sins and He will sanctify me. And He will prepare me for the final glorification, which we shall talk later. So, God is the origin of everything. The only participating thing we do here is faith. We have to come in faith and we should be ready to give up that which is not in accordance with God's will so that we can make whatever He wants in us. Um, Number two, I just want to give two examples of two people in the Bible, two scenarios. The first scenario is where one rich young ruler comes to Jesus. This ruler is a, a, a very educated man and he was very wealthy. He comes to Jesus and asks him, what can I do to be saved? In fact, it is in the book of uh, is it Luke. It is in Luke chapter 18, verse 18. So uh, let me read that to get some into perspective of what I want. Though we can easily come like that. We are in this church for many years, but we are like the young children. We will miss the objective of God. It says, now a certain ruler asked him, say, good teacher, what shall I do to let them know? You know, we are here in this church, or we are believers, because we have something we hope for in the future. And we shall also do what? Attain eternal life. We shall also live with God eternally. So that can only happen if first of all we, 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 we know what we need right now for us to, to be subject of the heavenly kingdom. So the religion you are asked, what do I do? And Jesus in the first 19 says, and said this to him, what do you, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. And verse 20 says, you know the commandments? Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not, do not, all, all those things. And the young ruler say, and he say, all these things are kept from my youth. And I want you to tell you, I want to tell you today, we can be here, all of us, we have observed those very well. We don't steal, we don't wash my doors, we don't commit adultery, we don't, we, we observe the Sabbath, all those things we can do. But they still. But Jesus said in verse 22. Now, you know, sometimes you wonder, how you sound all of them? Then what are you saying? You're missing one thing. Verse 22 says, so when Jesus had these things, he said to him, you still love one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. 
and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Amen. Thank you for your answers and that is very true. That all our efforts towards holiness they are useless. Apart from the work of Christ on the cross of Calvary for our sins and to the work of God's Holy Spirit in us. The book Galatians chapter 5 verses 16, 18 and 25 Paul speaks about it's by the Spirit. So by the Spirit of God we are sanctified. The book of Romans the chapter is 15 verse 16 Paul says we are sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And in the book of Romans 8 verse 13 he says it's by the Spirit of God that we are able to put to death the deeds of the body. We have one comment I want to come from the book from, from YouTube. And this is from our anybody who's in YouTube? Because I can see it. This is from my brother Evan Sopanga. He says, believers are to throw off everything that hinders and run with perseverance, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12. <coughs> The verse is 1 through 3. Thank you, Brother Evans, for that comment and reminding us that in the process is the work of God. And so when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we can run the race. What is our role in sanctification? God has done everything for us. So what is our role? Is there anything we need to do? All, it's the work of God, it's been done for us, and we are good. What is our role? I believe, uh, and I believe uh, that there is a role we need to play. Uh, as regards to justification, God has done everything for us. Ours is to believe in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. And we are counted just before God. In consecration or sanctification, that we, what that we say is a process of putting something apart for a, a holy or sacred purpose. Now, if, let's look at the example of what Christ did when he was healing the paralytic. There was a paralytic man who was laying sick and helpless for many years. What he did is he told him, stand up, take up your mask, and do what? And walk. Get up. Take up your mat. And walk. Now, supposing the paralytic did not stand up. Supposing he remained down there. I'm paralyzed. I'm down. We had a wrong thing. That is responding to the call to salvation. We also have a role to play in response. That is only in response to the call and the provision that God has made for the remittance and forgiveness of sins and the sanctification process. The book of Hebrews. Uh, 12 verse 14 he says we should pursue holiness for no one can please God without holiness without being holy and how do we achieve that 
that is not. We need to, res to respond to the guidance of the Holy Spirit that has to be process. Thank you very much, Brother Rebo. Before we come to uh, uh, the evidence, there's something I want to put clear here. There's something I want to put clear here. Uh, Brother Rebo has read from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 14, and it says, Pursue holiness. I want to say that that word holiness is equal to sanctification. So when he speaks about holiness, he has not drifted off from the topic sanctification. So you can say, pursue sanctification, which we cannot do it by ourselves, but we need to follow it. Yes, Elder Evans, how, what is our role in sanctification? I just want to use what I just said a few minutes ago. The young people really wanted to know how to do this. How Jesus gave him a very simple thing. What was the response of the young people? He was very sad. He left. <laughs> what does that mean? He did not want to pursue. That by the year. He can't be a righteous child of God. I just want to read some statement from Christ of the Lord. Page 93, 92 says, The love of self is a transgression of the Lord. This Jesus decided to reveal to the rich young girl, and he gave him a test that would make manifest the selfishness of his heart. He showed him the plague spot in his character. The young man decided no further to learn. You know, Jesus. Once we have become believers, what the Holy Spirit does keeps revealing to us our weaknesses, our wrong, our wrong characters, which he needs to remove and put us in a, a, a better position where we shall be able to sit with the Father who is born in heaven. So when we deny him that chance, then he has no option. That's why in the mission chapter 4, verse 30 says, Take care you don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieving those people say, I don't know, my father, and then you are going to be. No, it is, he keeps always telling us things that we need to stop, things that we need to learn, and therefore we become like his children. Now, the last example I want to give, when you go to chapter 19 of Luke, it gives another, another scenario, very good one. It talks about Circuits. Some, I think the origins of the pastor, they call it a chapter of salvation. Here, Sarkis is another rich man. I don't want to go to the, the, the sentiments of describing how Sarkis was looking like Sean Man. That's not relevant here. What is relevant to me is the way he hungers, thirsts. For, to see Jesus. If you remember what I, I said a few minutes ago, seeing Jesus is seeing salvation. Seeing Jesus is seeing eternal life. And we are saying here, those who believe in God and they believe in Christ, they are justified. They start a walk with God where every day they keep learning something about God and God makes them better citizens to live with the eternal. So in this, the way Sarkius passed to see Jesus, when Jesus, he could not be able to see because there were so many people around him, he decided to run and uh, climb a tree. Something I want you to know today in, the, in those days, in the, in the Eastern culture, it was very shameful, very wrong for a man to run. Man never did, men never did, they walked. So if someone could see a man running during the day, that was very shameful, but he didn't care about them. What did he care about? He wanted to see who? Jesus. So he found he wouldn't see him. Now he went even into more worse to climb up to him. He never climb up to him. A man of his, of his caliber. 
So he, he climbed that tree to see who? Jesus. So when Jesus came near where he was, he stopped. He said, Zacchaeus, come down. Today salvation has come to you. What was Jesus saying? What have I said a few years ago? Who is salvation? Jesus. So knowing Jesus is accepting him to be part of our life. To be in our life, in other words. So we should be ready. Our role, therefore, is to empty ourselves and allow Christ to fill himself in our lives. In all spheres, whether it's at work, whether it's at church, at our house, what should be seen by people is Jesus. And I like, maybe before I stop speaking, I like the way Sanctus responds to this invitation from Jesus. When Jesus goes to the house, he gives them food, they eat. Even if the others who are complaining, you know, the others who are complaining, why is he going to the tax collectors? Sanctus says, Lord, I know I've done wrong. There are those people I took money from them wrong. I am able to give them how many times? So you see, he's ready to amend, he's ready to make his way right where he can. And well, how he is responding. That's a response. Can I make a comment there? Because arising from my years, just comment. Okay. Um, Let's read first John chapter 3, verse 2. And uh, John 16, verse 13. John 3, verse 2. 3, verse 2. So, what's the goal of our sanctification process? Beloved. Now we are children of God. We are children of God. That is, that it, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. We don't know. We but, don't know after but, our, our sanctification process what we will be. Like. We shall be like. But we know when He is revealed. But we we'll know when Christ is. Revealed, then we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. But what I know, I don't know the, after the sanctification process, what will I will be like? But then John says here, one thing I know is that we will be like him, like Christ. So the sanctification process is meant to take us through and transform us into the likeness of who? Of Christ. And how we achieve that. Now, uh, that, that takes us back to the, to the work of the Holy Spirit. John 16, verse 13. The Holy Spirit will open for us the truth in God's work. He will make us understand God and His will in our lives as it is in the Bible. Because the Spirit will translate and make us understand the Bible. And then give us the power to change and be like Christ. Because in our lesson we did this morning is that the new covenant the new covenant will be written where? In our hearts. And who, who is the new covenant? Jesus Christ is the new covenant. Because Jesus Christ will be in our hearts, we will be transformed and be like him who is in us. So that, if I don't know what I look like, what I will be, but I know I will be like who? Like Christ. Thank you, thank you much. The question uh, the panelists have been endeavoring to answer is what is our role in sanctification? Those who have just joined us, if you have a comment, 
If you have a question, you can feel free to use our YouTube. And we will be able to read your comment or your question. And we will try to answer as much as we can. Or we can do a discussion on the topic of sanctification. The book is Galatians chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 5, verse 16. What is our role? What my brothers have said is true. But I want to add this. Chapter 16, verse 16 says, So, I say, live by the Spirit. Paul is reminding us that in the process of sanctification, our role is to live by the Spirit of God. What the Spirit says is what we need to do. Verse 18, 18 says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. If we would allow the Spirit of God to lead us, then we will not be under the law. Number one, lead by the Spirit. Number two, to be led by the Spirit. And number three, verse 25, Verse 25, 25 says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Number three is to keep in step. You know, when you are walking with somebody, you must walk at the same speed if you are going to be together. And so, Paul reminds us that we need to walk in step with the Spirit. That we are in total agreement with the Spirit of God. Number one, live by the Spirit. So we need to start living by the Spirit. You know you cannot live with somebody in the house unless you agree with them. So number one, live by the Spirit. Number two, we must allow you know, it's me who allows you to be my friend. So when we talk to you and I'm close to you, it's because I have allowed it. So we must allow to be led by the Spirit of God. And lastly, number three, to be in step with the Spirit of God. When we were speaking about sanctification and when we were dividing it, we say it is holiness. It is the cleansing. So for us to have that, when we read from the book of John chapter 17, verse 17, he says, now sanctify them by the truth, and your word is truth. So now we need the truth of Christ. And the truth of Christ is found in his word. And that one will lead us and it will help us to live a holy life. That is fulfilling the life of Christ. In our discussion, they have said that now we need to be or to come to the point where we are by Christ. How do we get there? How do we get to be like Christ? I try every day, and the things I want to do, those I don't get to do. I found myself sinning. So how do I get to be like Christ so that I don't sin at any point? To the panelists or to anyone who is listening to us, so we can discuss how do we get to be like Christ. Okay. Let me ask you. Actually, it's like you must have it. <laughs> oh, I did. Okay. I did no, this is how you answer. Yeah. We need the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I remember the key text that we read, those 14 17. The Spirit of God is the one who will enable us to even understand the word. 
is what actually is uh, John 16, verse 8. It says, that is uh, from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. It says, when you read John 16, verse 8, it says, 16, verse 14, you can start from 8, 1 through 14. It tells us that the Holy Spirit of God will. Uh, let, 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 let me put this. The office of the Holy Spirit is distinctly specified in the words of Christ. When He comes, He will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. That is the Spirit. And then the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot explain it. It is because the Lord has not filled it to them. Um, I'll left it somewhere up there. But what the, 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 the book of uh, Acts of the Apostles said, when we give ourselves and our lives to God, our lives and response will be in response to the dictates and the guidance and explanation and the remembrance of the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit of God will enable us, enable us to understand what the will of God is. And how do we get to know what the will of God is? By studying the word of God. And the word of God, if you read also 2 Timothy 3.16 This is the second of first Timothy. It says, the word of God is inspired by the Spirit of God. So, the Spirit of God will enable us to understand the word of God which shapes our character and our approach and our mind to be like that word of Christ. Thank you much, Elder Evans. Do you have anything to add? Uh, I'm reading from um, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that the life and godliness and the world the last we should live soberly. Righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So, the way to become like Christ is to receive Him. Jesus is salvation. He has appeared to all men. And then through this, not all men will be saved. Why? It depends who received him. Who saw him? Many of us have seen him. But have we responded? Have we taken him deep? Revelation 3.20 says, Look at Jesus. He is standing by the door. He is knocking. Jesus can't get crashed into our house. We have to let him be. So what Brother Rebo has just said, that receiving Jesus Christ is receiving the blowings of the Holy Spirit in our life. We have to obey and respond to what the Holy Spirit says. So to become like Jesus is to know him. To become intimate through reading his word, praying, sharing with others, helping others. You know, we cannot, there's no way we can bring, you know, we can't express that vision without talking.
talking about the way we live because it exhibits whether we are children of God or we are children of the world. And the world shows, and that's why you read very well in Job. Job teacher in the universe, so they still say, Sanctify the truth, and the truth is your word. And people still explore, and then what is the word? Find this Jesus. So, where we are going to know Jesus, we are going to know Jesus. Jesus is the truth. So, we are going to know Jesus. Can be the Son of God. We, the one we have just read a few minutes ago in the first John 3, we could have read first one says, What a mother of love. That we are going to children of God. Why? Because God has revealed to us his love through Jesus Christ. So, for us to become children of God, we accept the revelation of God. And who is that? Jesus Christ. So, for us to become like him, we have to receive him into our lives. We have to allow him to change our life to any way he wants us to be. So, we, the way we live, the way we eat, the way we, we do our work, should show we are children of God. So, we are the ones to go and examine our lives whether we reveal Christ or we reveal self. We reveal the world. So where you find you are more, that's where you are. But the, 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 the subject or the objective of God is by the end of this process, He makes us to be like His Son. And the people who live with God will be like Jesus. If we are not like Jesus, forget about that. And as, this is what I, what I was looking for, also to one of the that, is that um, that's a uh, act of the apostles. Acts 2, paragraph 4. It says, having brought conviction of sin, that is the Holy Spirit, having brought the conviction of sin, and presented before the mind of the standard of righteousness, the Holy Spirit withdraws the affections from the beings of this earth and fills the soul with a desire of holiness. That's why it says, He will take you into all truth. The Savior declared, If men are willing to be molded, there will be brought about a sanctification of the whole being. So, that is actually summarizes the question that we put forward. Thank you very much. We are almost coming to the end. I don't want us to go back to the opening text to read it one more time. And then we will have a small discussion and we will be finishing. The book is John chapter 17, the verse is number 17. Jesus is praying for his disciples and is praying for us. Now this is our prayer. This is what the prayer says. Sanctify them by the word. Sanctify them by the truth. Thy, the truth is thy word. I don't know I'm paraphrasing, but I guess I put it right. Sanctify them by the truth. The truth is thy word. Sanctify means make them holy, cleanse them, eliminate them from sin by your truth. And thy truth, and thy truth is thy word. And the heaven is just saying about the word of God being Christ. So the primary question here is by reading the word of God. Am I getting sanctified? When I'm reading the word of God, am I getting sanctified? Am I getting holy? Am I getting separated from sin? Am I getting purified? Am I getting set apart? Maybe a question to ask another question. Yeah. 
Maybe a question you can answer another question today. Why are you leaving the word of God? If I'm not what is your motive? motive? What is the objective of reading the word of God? To know God. I want to believe that is the objective. To know God. And knowing God, in the past, he says, is eternal life. So that is the way to go. The way to start becoming like a child of God, you have to read the word of God. But there are, right? There are quotations, caution. Chapter 18 of Luke said, a young rich ruler came to Jesus. He asked him, do you know the commandments? He said, he read all of them. What do we see? The young people had everything, they had all the knowledge of the commandments. Was he saved? No. And so in other words, we can read, but we have to allow the words to make a change in our lives. Because that is the voice of God. And when God speaks to us, for example, he says, you need to help the needy, right? I don't just read and look at someone to do that. See, you need to, to do the following. So what we have to object, we have to make the word to be objective to us. If the word has to speak to me, and I have to check that this word has said, don't, we, we have a tendency, because of we are sinners, we have a tendency of always applying what we read on other people. We don't allow the word to speak to us. When we are reading, we, we, we see someone. Now, yes, simple. I think this one is speaking about so and so. No, it's speaking about you and me. So when you read, let us allow the word to speak to me. So whenever, and that's why Paul says, the word of God, when you read, the, the law is a mirror. So when you look at the mirror, the mirror doesn't remove the, the wrong thing which is it has seen on your face. You remove it. But here, to, to make it more brief, is that the word of God, as written in the word in the Bible, reveals who Christ Jesus is. Who God the Father is, who God the Holy Spirit is. So God holy reveals Himself to us through His Word. And He speaks to us through His Word. So we are the ones to take these words and apply them in our lives. Allow, by the way, it says, the, the, the grace of God has appeared to all men, and this grace becomes the enabler. The one who enables me, you and me to overcome, to become like Jesus. The, the truth is, the way we are made because of sin, we cannot do anything good. And the thing is that what we have said, unless we are holy, we can never see who